Welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics. As we lead into spring break for the legislature, a much-needed one maybe, we're joined by Senator Paul Whelan of Jefferson County. Yeah. Senator, very glad to have you on This Week in Missouri Politics. Glad to be here. What an end to the first half of session in the Senate. Uh, coming off the PQ, this week um, you put in a lot of hours, but not a lot happened in the Senate. Not a lot in the floor. We did, were able to catch up on some of our committee work, which was mm -hmm. kind of good because during the filibuster week, we a lot of committee meetings were canceled. Sure. So it kind of worked out good that we were able to spend more time in committee this last week before we got out of town. So this week, uh, the, major the, the minority members of the Democrat Party forced the reading of the journal, which is normally not done. Took quite a while. Um, you know, uh, but just a note on last week, Senator Kevney held the floor last Thursday for several hours and wanted to talk about some of the, the, uh, the anomalies that happened right. uh, with the Highway Patrol being referenced, with uh, uh, different members being called and, and put in when custody was an issue, how they'd come back. Let me ask you, do you believe that this is nearing an end and there's some agreement coming to the senators and we'll be able to move forward? I, yeah, I do. And I think both sides have members on both sides that are looking forward to the break, giving people to get home, kind of breathe, relax, reassess where we're at, and come back and kind of start getting back to the people's work. You know, I think it, we wanted to have you on this week, especially because you're known as a senator that does walk softly and carry a big stick. You don't do bluster. You would be one of the senators that have relationships across the aisle. Right. When you talk to the members in the Democratic Party, do you believe they're finally coming to a place where they can move forward and avoid another PQ and avoid some of the acrimony we've seen? I think the majority of them do. I mean, every the thing about the Senate is everybody's individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have a relationship with a lot of senators that are Democrats, and a lot of them that, that I talk to, I think we're getting to that point to where everybody says, okay, you know, we had to do the filibuster, you had to do the PQ, we had to oppose the PQ, now let's bury the hatchet, let's move forward. We should have got to do the budget. There's a lot of issues that are important to both of the Republicans and the Democrats that we want to address this year. So I think we're getting to that point. The thing about the Senate, though, is you should have individuals. Yeah. So we have individuals on our side, we have individuals on their side that may not be ready to do that, but I would say, in my opinion, the majority of the Senate is ready to move forward. So your opinion as an individual Senate, the Senate is a... Uh, a lot of senators view themselves as the upper chamber compared to the House because they, they are individuals. They do make their own minds up. Right. You can't, they can hold the floor and filibuster, and one senator could stop a bill. When you do PQs, you give up a lot of that right as a senator. Yeah. What is your view on when the right time is to vote for a PQ? Well, the PQ to me is when, when you absolutely have, have no further way of any negotiation moving forward. And I think we got to that point, and that's why I supported the PQ this last time. Last year, during the final mm -hmm. week, when we, they did the PQ on the right to work, we had only debated it eight, maybe ten hours. And I thought there was still a chance that we could have some kind of compromise or some kind of thing could work out. And that's why I didn't support that PQ. Uh, the rules have it that you know, any senator can speak as long as they want. The filibuster is totally, perfectly acceptable. But the rules also have the PQ in there. And, um, and so I think there's times where sometimes you get to a point and you're just like, if we're 12 hours, we've got no movement, no discussion, then it's time to use the PQ. And that's, I guess, why I gauged my decision on. Speaking of, you've been a senator that's been outspoken in supporting labor and supporting business owners that want to have labor unions in their companies. Right. Do you worry that the that's not maybe the majority opinion in your caucus? Do you worry right. sometime that PQ will be used to steamroll you in the future? It, it well, it may. I mean, that's. I mean, it does. I mean, but I guess my my thing would be is give us enough time to try to work on a compromise before you, the PQ is used. I guess against the issue that I'm trying to slow down or compromise mm -hmm. on. But I would say this: that if I'm on the minority side of an issue and yeah. we're trying to delay and we're trying to get compromise, if I stop reaching out and I stop trying to work on that compromise, then by all means, that's when you should say, okay, it's time to PQ. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Because it's, when the discussion stops, then we're just wasting time. Do you believe this session you'll see more anti-labor measures brought up in the Senate? Um, well, I think the um, paycheck protection, which has already been voted on, is on the governor's hands at the moment. I, have, I think that'll probably come back. What'll happen with that, I'm not really sure. But I think that's probably the only major labor issue that mm -hmm. we're probably going to deal with this year in the Senate. Speaking of other work in the Senate, you've been very active on ports. Jefferson County has a port issue that right. you've been extremely active in. Where's the status of that? Well, I've got a bill, actually, it's on third reading calendar when the filibuster hit. So kind of, <laughs> we were doing really good there and everything came to a grinding <laughs> halt. It's still on the third reading calendar. Hopefully we'll get that out of the Senate early once we get back from breaking over to the House. Um, but it's important, ports are important not just for my district, but for the whole state of Missouri. We're centrally located. Um, the Mississippi River gives us a straight line straight down to New Orleans. They're redoing the Panama Canal. 
Um, we've got a great opportunity to become a shipping hub for the entire Midwest to bring our agricultural products down and out through the Panama Canal to the world. But the time is of the essence. This opportunity is only going to last so long. So I liken it a lot to well, there was a time in Missouri history where we could have the railroads. And we said, no, yeah. we don't want them. And they all went to Chicago. If we don't get on the ball and act now and get our ports going and functioning, there's going to be other places on the river that are going to do it. But we're just we're poised so great that it's an opportunity I hate to see us lose. Well, you've teamed with Representative Becky Ruth on that right. a lot, mm -hmm. and she's done a lot of work on that in the House right. side. Yeah. Do you feel like this is the year that makes that happen? I think this is a, it's an exciting year. The House came out with $10 million for port funding this year. The first year I was in the legislature, they were hovering around $3 million a year for all the ports around the state of Missouri. So we've increased that, which is good. And I think the rest of the legislature, even the governors, just recently visited the Panama Canal. So I think everybody is on board saying, hey, this is an important issue. This is something we need to act on now. We need to move forward on now. So I think I'm, I'm optimistic. Let's talk politics real quick. Uh, the governor's race, the most exciting governor's race anybody's got to cover on the Republican side, maybe in a generation. Uh, four members, uh, four people running. Do you have a favorite yet? I don't really have a favorite, I would say. Right now, I'm still kind of watching them all. Um, I, I do like all of them to a certain extent, and there's things that maybe trouble me about all of them to a certain extent. So I'm kind of neutral at the moment. Uh, this week, the Columbia Chamber and the University of Missouri put on a debate. It was really the, the thing that was taken away from it was uh, Eric Greitens, uh, candidate, been a very successful fundraiser, but his biggest supporters give him a million dollars, is ensnared in some sex slave allegations. Uh, a lot of the folks called on him to give that money back uh, while this is pending until this gets sorted out. Do you believe he should give the money back? I would think so, yeah. I mean, at a certain point in time, you have to decide what kind of credibility you have as, a, as an individual and who you're going to accept money from and who you're not going to accept money from. If it was me, I would definitely give it back, yeah. Well, uh, John Kasich, I believe, he had money from the same person and gave it back already. Right. It, uh, it, do you think he will, though? It kind of seems like he's digging in. It is a million dollars. You, you I mean. know, the interesting thing to me is, and I'm, like I said, I don't really um, have a favorite. I'm not here working for anybody. Um, but Mr. Greitens runs as an outsider. He wants to be like, I'm not like everybody else. I'm not going to do what other people do. But then by taking this money, he kind of presents himself as being, I'm just like everybody else. Uh, you know what I mean? Because everybody yes. says money is the, you know, was what makes politics so bad. Well, here he is saying, well, money is more important than, you know, doing what's right. So he, he, he loses his outsider status as he keeps that money, in my opinion. Last question while you have you here on the heels of the, of the Missouri primary where Trump just edges out Cruz. Uh, do you have a favorite yet in the president's I've race? I've endorsed um, Cruz, yes. Do you believe he gets it at a convention? Do you think, can he overtake Trump? You know, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens from this point forward with the other states. I don't think Trump will get the necessary votes needed by winning primaries, but the undeclared candidates may give him the numbers. But I think it's going to be real close going into the, the convention. It's going to be neck and neck. Well, as is interesting, and as it's neck and neck, we hope you'll be join us again on This Week in Missouri Politics. Yeah, I look forward to it. I Thank you, Senator. Thanks. Thank you. We'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel, but first we'll leave you with this week's leading Missouri economic indicators. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more.
Back to this week in Missouri politics. Now, time for our opinion maker panel. First time on the show, but I don't think it's going to be the last time. David Turner, spokesman from the Missouri Democratic Party. Thanks for having me. Mark Zinn, Big 550. Love to have you on. Political Great to be reporter. Here. Love to. First time on. Looking forward to getting your insights, and we may even get to talk weather if we have time. That's huge. <laughs> Rick Stream, our viewers know you very well. Former representative, ran for county executive, now running for state senate, right? That's correct. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure to have you back. And uh, friend of the show, Jeff Mazur, the greatest quotes we've had come a lot from you. Now with launch code, so let's launch into it. Senate slowdown comes off of the SGR 39 debate. Um, two things. I thought the minority in the Senate did what they need to do this week, but maybe it's time to start conducting business again. And then SGR 39 started running into problems as business groups began to come out and attack it. What a quandary the Republicans are in. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the Republican, the, the SJR 39 is about, in some ways, people's, um, uh, their opinions, their views of what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, people can disagree on what you think about that bill. I certainly think it's a wrong direction for the state and a lot of business groups, too. We see the NCAA uh, this, yeah. this, just this morning putting out a statement saying that, uh, basically, we don't like the idea of having our events in places where we have a law like this on the books, uh, which is unsurprising given the past uh, in Indiana when they mm -hmm. passed a law like this and, and what have you. And I think as far as the Senate slowdown goes, uh, the notion that people should stick by their guns and let their conscience be their guide, uh, you know, if that's the animating factor behind something like SJR 39, you certainly can't blame the Democrats who stand up and say, we're going to slow down business here because our conscience tells us that this is something that's very wrong that's happened in this chamber. And, you know, we're going to do what we can to make sure that, that a price is going to be paid for, uh, for what's happened. Yeah, General, I worked in politics when the Democrats held the majority in the Senate. And the filibuster was a very important tool Republicans took mm -hmm. to keep things from passing. Um, do you think the messaging on this has came out to where the Democrats may end up with a, with overall a victory on the issue? Oh, I absolutely think so. You know, constitutionalizing intolerance isn't in the values of Missourians. And I, you know, frankly, what Republicans are trying to do, um, they're splitting their own base. They're splitting their own party. You see the Chamber of Commerce just coming out this week um, against this bill. And I think you're going to see more and more groups, more and more businesses coming out against it. It's not good for the economy, and it's certainly not good for Missouri's reputation. And I think that's something that Republicans need to think about. Representative Stream, to me, it, it, it seemed like there were some things that happened with it. That, who wants to force people to bake a cake that they don't want to bake, right? But at the end of the day, is it, is it right to put something in the Constitution where you don't actually have a Missouri instance? If there was someone in Belton that could say, this happened to me, don't you think the messaging would be very different on this? And people could relate to it. Well, I think the whole issue, uh, first of all, the slowdown. I mean, it's, this, this is Senate prerogative. The Democrats can certainly filibuster. And it went on for 39, 40 hours. And that's why the PQ was used. And whether you agree or not with the PQ being used, that's, that, that was the Democrats' prerogative. They could do that. So. Uh, as far as the bill, I mean, it's it's just gotten through the Senate. Uh, it's uh, it's got to get through the House. The changes could be made to it. I've heard uh, business groups say that if it's changed here or there, sure. uh, it could be it could be acceptable to them. So um, I mean, it's it's a balance between uh, religious freedom and constitutional rights uh, uh, on discrimination. I mean, it's it's a tough thing uh, to balance because the country was settled on the basis of of uh, religious freedom. The people coming over to settle our country in the early 1600s were coming because of they had been persecuted religiously in the old countries of Europe. And 150 years after that persecution, it was put as the first freedom in the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, uh, freedom of religion. So that's, that's a factor that has to be considered in all of this. I think that, uh, the, you know, I, I always told people when they wanted me to not to vote for or for a bill, mm -hmm. wait till it gets through the whole process before you ask, because every bill changes along the way. And once it goes through the House, I think you'll see some changes. I don't know. I'm not there. Mark Zinn, uh, this is an odd debate because you have the generally people that support the Republicans in the Chambers of Commerce and the business community opposing them on this issue. Uh, they seem to be doing a bit of a box. I mean, is this... It just, it's, it's interesting to me because is this really the biggest issue going on in Missouri right now, the issues that voters care about, issues that the unemployed care about? I mean, I just think that having the Senate 
really focused on this and slowed down because of this, it just is, it speaks volumes on, on the ability uh, for our state really not to get anything done, at least the legislator pack, because there, there are a lot of other issues going on right well, now. Well, it's an interesting thing. You know, you have the Republican Party and you, you wonder why you're a Republican. Right. There could be a baker somewhere that could be forced to bake a cake they didn't want to bake, which is unfortunate. I, I think a lot of people think that's unfortunate and wrong. But there's a tax cut that would help everyone. Right. Senator Schmidt filed a $2 billion tax cut. It hasn't made any floor time. I think they need to focus on the priorities. I don't think this is really a priority. I think it's a smokescreen. And I think that uh, at the end of the day, voters, when it comes to August and November, um, they, they, they care about the pocketbook issues and not, and not necessarily these ones. Representative, you're running to be a state senator. Right. That means you will be able to stop legislation. What's your thoughts on PQs? Well, in the House, of course, we use the PQ mm -hmm. frequently um, after debate. Uh, As senators used to point out to make themselves feel better. That's now. right. But um, I always heard that once you go down to the other side of the building, things change. <laughs> and uh, first of all, you get a lobotomy before you go down there. So, uh, but no, it's uh, the Senate rules are different. And uh, if you want to have a filibuster, that's, the, that's your prerogative. And I think uh, that should be honored. Uh, people... Uh, as you pointed out, when the Republicans were in the minority, and I knew some of the senators, uh, Cliff Jones and others, they would use the filibuster. Sure. Uh, and occasionally, uh, the PQ would be used. Uh, when The first year I was up there in 2007, Mike Gibbons said, uh, we only use the PQ as a last resort. Jeff Mazur, you've seen both sides of this. Um, is this something, if you start to make the PQ more used in the Senate, at some time it comes back to bite you? Look, it's not just Democrats who are, who are decrying what happened in the Senate there mm -hmm. with the PQ. Uh, people who, who Rick served with in the House, uh, Senator Sylvie and Senator Dixon uh, and Senator Schaaf, all spoke up to say, hey, not only do we not think PQ is appropriate in this situation, but that there are a variety of other kind of ways in which the chamber is being managed that uh, is really uh, reminiscent of the way things work in the House, and we don't think that's good. We served in the House. Uh, we're in the Senate now, and we think this should be run like the Senate. So um, to cast this so just as a kind of a partisan fight about whether or not to use the PQ, I think really doesn't get to the depth of the issue. We have guys like, like Sylvie and Schaff who are saying, no, no, we shouldn't go down this road. And I think really kind of coming in direct conflict with, um, uh, with Senator uh, Richard and others who run in the chamber and saying, we're going to make this more like the House, where we're going to ramrod things through uh, if and when we're ready to ramrod them through. Well, as a former House staffer, the one silver lining is, if you have friends in the Senate that were sanctimonious, then you don't have to listen to that anymore. So that's the, that's the upside. Presidential primary uh, this week, David Turner, Hillary Clinton barely edged out a socialist. Right. Is there a, there's got to be a problem. No, you know, I think Hillary Clinton clearly has a past the nomination. She's going to be the nominee. Um, but barely edging out a socialist. Well, you know, I think she ran a strong campaign here. I think she ran a, she's running a strong campaign in general. You know, both candidates, frankly, are good, have run good, solid campaigns. You've seen a lot of, uh, you know, enthusiasm behind both campaigns. And frankly, I think Democrats are in a good position because look who the Republicans are, are putting at the top of their ticket. Okay, we just saw why Dave is good at his job, Mark Zinn. There's no enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton anywhere. No, no, not, There's not really. Well, I mean, I was actually pretty impressed, even though it was a small uh, margin that she won, that she ended up uh, squeezing out that victory. But you, you talk to Bernie supporters, especially in, on the youth and the uh, younger people, um, they're really enthusiastic about Bernie. They, they feel the burn, and you really don't feel people... Scary, almost. Yeah, well, you know, but they, you don't feel people feeling the hill, you know, as, as much, <laughs> uh, at least on the younger generation. It, it, the question is, can Hillary um, get these Bernie supporters, especially the young ones, the college-age students, the people under 30, the millennials, to come out and support her uh, in, a, in a general election. Jeff Mazur, you don't know anybody that's passionate about Hillary Clinton. Be honest. No, absolutely I do. Look, you know, all, you do look, all you have to do is look in St. Louis. People who are very influential people in St. Louis. Uh, yes. The Antonio Frenches of the world, Mary Ellen Ponders, people who are in positions of power um, in the city. Uh, tremendously excited uh, by the prospect of people like uh, of Hillary Clinton and her candidacy. We saw that in terms of energy here in St. Louis around the Missouri primary. And I think that um, because uh, Hillary Clinton has been in the news media for going on two plus decades now, and Bernie Sanders is, you know, flavor of the month in a way. It's something new uh, on the national scene. There's a, uh, you know, there's a novelty factor that goes along with that. But in the end, uh, we're seeing this Democratic primary play out exactly the way we thought it would play out. Uh, in that, sure, Bernie maybe has been a little stronger around the country than we thought we would. In the end, everyone knew that Hillary's strength of organization. Uh, that the, the experience she had in, in politics like this in these national campaigns was going to ultimately allow her to overwhelm uh, whatever opposition there was uh, in the primary. And she's going to move into this, uh, into the nomination, I think, with a minimum of muss and fuss on the other side, 
uh, everything is going exactly in the reverse of the way we thought it would go in a Republican primary, where there were very strong candidates who everyone thought were going to do well. That's been topsy-turvied. Nobody who uh, was the kind of front runner at the beginning of this process for Republicans is in a position to do well or win the nomination, and things are upside down there. I think that you may be right about the organization overwhelming. I mean, to me, the victory is an is a testament to the Missouri political icon, Joyce Abusi. Crystal Brinkley ran a great campaign. Um, it did look like she did overwhelm Sanders, but still, I mean, I, my, the assumption is she'd be a much better president than presidential candidate, but now you can't be impressed by what's happened so far. I mean, who would have thought that it would have been that close? Listen, she's, at the end of the day, is in position to win this nomination. Uh, that's what she had to do. Representative Stream, you're running, you're running for state senate in a district that's a Republican district, right. but do you worry about having Donald Trump at the top of the ticket? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. Let me get to it in a minute. I, I have to say something about Hillary Clinton. Um, I think she's completely disqualified from being president based on how she's handled classified material. I held a secret and top secret clearance for 34 years serving in the Navy and working for the Department of Defense. If I had done one one thousandth of what she has done, I would be in federal prison, which is where she belongs. There is no excuse for what she did, and we know why she did it. As far as Donald Trump, uh, it's true. This is a topsy-turvy year. Uh, the Democratic primary points that out. Or certainly the Republican primary points that out. People that we all thought, the governors, for instance, that would be running strongly at this point in time, have bis basically disappeared, except for John Kasich. And um, I don't think anybody believed that Donald Trump would be going this far. I think it points out uh, the, the, the very um, severe a disappointment with the electorate on both sides of the aisle, that's why Bernie's done so well, with how the direction of this country at this point in time. Seventy to seventy-five percent of the people are unhappy with the direction of the country. That's why Donald Trump has done as well as he's done. Ted Cruz has done as well as he's done, because they're viewed as outsiders that are going to shake up Washington, D.C. Mark Zinn, I believe if you look at the numbers, far, far, far more Republicans voted than Democrats. He has brought a bunch of energy to the Republican Party, but can he win a national election? I think if it's against Hillary Clinton, and really on that on that end, you can spin it any, either way you want with the email scandal. But there's an investigation going on, and there is a chance that she could be indicted or at least have charges recommended. What does that do to the Democratic Party? I mean, is that a situation, and maybe you guys could speak to it, is that a situation where Bernie could come back or somebody else could come in? Because if she's indicted... <laughs> That's kind of like, that I mean, ends our campaign. Wouldn't that be the, the optimum situation if she steps away for some reason and Joe Biden comes in and wins 40 states, which we probably would? Right. This race might look differently if a, an Elizabeth Warren had decided to get in a primary early mm -hmm. on. The notion of indictment or any other kind of uh, charges or something like that, I think, is, is beyond ludicrous at this point. It's not going to happen. Uh, Hillary Clinton is going to advance. It's, it's fair to say it's, it's highly unlikely to happen. Completely ludicrous. I, will go, I don't know about that. I will go on, I'll go on the record here and, and tape this. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it won't happen. I have me back on uh, if it does happen. I will take that, I think you're right. I'll apologize. Then. But there's still a chance, though. There is a chance. And, and this is, I think this is Republicans throwing a Hail Mary when they have a candidate who has been, who refused to immediately disavow the KKK, who has said multiple, you know, again and again sexist things, made it a talking point in his stump speech. And now they're looking for ways to try to discredit Hillary Clinton, who's maybe one of the more qualified presidential candidates we've had in modern presidential campaign history. Well, let's talk about something that definitely is going down, Representative Stream. The Republican race for governor on the, on the GOP side, they had a debate this week. Do you have a favorite in the race yet? No, I don't. Uh, I think all four are very good candidates, and uh, I think they'll win the governorship. Mark Zinn, um, they had a debate last, uh, in Columbia this week. The biggest issue, they all pretty much agree on the issues. They say they do. Their track records are a little different going back in history. But uh, there was an issue with Eric Greitens. He's been a great fundraiser. Mm -hmm. Probably his calling card in the race is his, his, his ability to fundraise. He took a million dollars from a person that's ensnared in a scandal where anytime you have sex slave and, and you know, largest supporter in the headlines, it's not good. good. No. Does he have the money back? I think he has to. Um, now, he's saying, hey, let's let the uh, process play out. You don't want to convict <laughs> somebody in a public trial, which is... But when you have all three of your Republican um, candidates running against you and the Democratic nominee, presumed Democratic nominee, saying to give the money back, I think it's pretty smart. On his end, though, it's his biggest donor. If this is a $1,000 contribution, it's already sent back, right? I agree. Yeah, I mean, but I a million dollars, I mean, 
So I, I, I get, I guess I get why he wouldn't send it back, but I, I, I really feel like it's, it's a no-brainer. This is really going to hurt him because character counts. I think character really does count in this race, and if he is the nominee, I think character counts as something that he could use against Chris Coster, but this is just something that really just... But David Turner, have you just been living well to get this sort of karma <laughs> you sent know, to you? You know, Eric Greitens wrote in his book that it's easier to preach at people than to practice with them. And frankly, <laughs> frankly, right now, he is preaching at people, and he's not even listening to his own advice. He put out an ethics plan that he's not even following. He has a $500,000 donor who is under investigation uh, by the federal government. He now has a donor who is involved in a sex scandal, at the very least, and maybe something even more troubling um, if it goes further. And he's refusing to turn back the money, even though he's saying that everybody else should. I think Eric Greitens needs to start listening to his own advice. Jeb, you've seen a lot of people run for office. It is very tough to come into politics and run for the top job in the state. And when you call the legislative leadership corrupt and everybody's corrupt, you really put yourself on a high pedestal and you make these attacks seem more, uh, they, they, make, they fit the narrative more. He's running on the idea that he brings a special, unique brand of leadership that's absent from the scene in Jefferson City. And the very first time that there's a, a, a crisis in terms of a, a controversy in his campaign, his means of that special leadership is to say, let's let the process play out. Let's let the civil courts decide this, and I'm not going to you know, say yay or nay and cast judgment on this guy who I took a million dollars from. I don't think that's the kind of leadership uh, he thinks he can run on and win. Richard, one thing I noticed through this is that after the events of last year, some thought Catherine Hannaway, who's always been known as a very aggressive campaigner, would be back you know, on, the, on her back foot on this. But she's led the charge. This is an issue. The, uh, the, uh, sex slave type things, or she's, she's only a federal prosecutor, and she was very forceful. Yeah, I think the optics of the whole situation look pretty bad for uh, Eric Reitens. Um, he's a very good uh, fundraiser. Uh, I don't know why he doesn't just return the money, let the process play out, as you mentioned, and if, if the man is exonerated completely, then he could, he could get Quick the money Quick predictions, back. Does, does he give the money back? I don't think so. Does he give it back? I think he has to. Dave Turner, does he give the money back? I think he has to. Jeff Mazur? Give it back as his whole theory of the race. When take millions of dollars from hedge funders and venture capitalists. Can't well, win without it. And we hope all of you will come back and join us as we talk about this race as it moves toward the primary in August. Until next week, we'll see you then on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, brought to you in part by Sterling Bank.